Welcome to the Game Inflators Podcast, episode 38. My name is John, and I'm joined by what is left of Ryan. Hey, everybody. Here at the Game Deflators Podcast, we like to talk about games we've recently picked up, games we're currently playing, and I love Led Zeppelin, but not as much as I love the Inflation Deflation Challenge. And uh, for all of you wondering, the reason I'm asking uh, what's left of Ryan is we just played an awesome Inflation Deflation game with Symbiotes. Uh, I've got a little bit of separation anxiety, but, you know, I think I'm still all there. Uh, you know, here at the Game Deflators Podcast, I like to use that intro every week. But more and more I find myself not having any recent pickups and not really currently playing much, so there's something wrong with me that I need to get fixed, apparently. Well, dude, on a weekly basis, you at least get to play one game for 30 minutes to an hour and having no experience with it whatsoever, nor do you really care about the game until after the fact. Yeah, at least I get that much, John. That is very true. All right, well, assuming you have no pickups this week because, well, you are not a great game deflator. Well, and I'm still, you know, toying with the idea of how I'm going to reach into, you know, the mail order games. I got to look know, at that still. I, I really still have wonder, it, it's a shame that you don't have access to a plethora of games that you can grab at any point. And Wait, just it's, like, not, it's not about not having games to play. I got games to play. I just don't got time to play them. Well, it's a shame that, you know, Gamefly, if you go through that route, you know, you can pick any game, right, and, and play it for a little bit. If you don't like it, bring it back. It, it's a real shame. I mean, I am i don't see a wall in here with thousands of games that you could pick from and, and just play. Well, I don't have all these consoles, John. It's a shame that you don't have somebody that has all these consoles so you can go ahead and play. John, I ain't got time to be wired down by wired controllers. That that is also true. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about our <laughs> the uh, ultimate way around. Well, let's let's just change the segments. This is John's recent pickups. Um, this week, shout out to Leaping Lizard Cosplay, good friend of mine. Uh, she was uh, selling a ton of video games this week, and I picked up Fatal Frame One, Two, and Three, Persona Two, a map that is for uh, the the insert map for Legend of Zelda: Link to the Past on SNES, and Animaniacs on SNES as well. Um, Fatal Frames a series I've always wanted to get all three for PS2 finally did and then uh, when I was putting them on my shelf I realized I already owned Fatal Frame 2 complete in box so that I guess is getting sold um, any questions Ryan on my recent pickups how much uh, god how much was it all uh, 210 I think with shipping that's what it came out to which actually isn't bad I mean she cut me a pretty good deal and um a good portion of that is, you know, my history knowing this individual and the idea of that if it was sold on eBay, she would net less. So it was kind of getting a little bit of money in there to, to help her out. It was a good deal. So here's a challenge for you, John. As a collector who owns two complete inbox copies of Fatal Frame 2, what would you say it goes for? About 44 bucks complete in box. <clears throat> Less or higher? Down. 35. Down. Really? 30. Ah, 31.69. Which is a uh, check Fatal Frame 3. I'm curious what that's going for. I know the series as a whole is probably about 120. Which actually isn't bad. Fatal Frame 3, 39.99. All right, so it's close on that one. Number one's probably in the 25 to 30 range as well. Let's find out. Let's find out. It's folks. a new game. Awkward silence. Awkward silence. Fatal Frame 3386. Okay. So not too bad. So we're looking at about 90 something bucks plus the Persona and an Animaniacs and the map, which I think is 10 to 20 usually. It's not a bad deal. So I got a pretty good deal on that. And I'm happy about that. As long as you're happy with it. I mean, as a collector, you're willing to pay more for things that you want. And as long as you're getting a good price. That's better than paying what you would actually pay to get it. Well, and Persona 2, uh, and it's the PS1, um, I think it's Eternal Punishment is what I got instead of like the PSP version of Innocent Sin. But that's a game series that continues to go up in price. Like Persona 1 is sitting at like 250 or 300 bucks right now. And uh, that's the PS1 version as well. I think the PSP versions are floating at about 100, uh, complete in box. And uh, I've always wanted to play those, but I just haven't really wanted to shell out the money. And I had a few items I sold recently and just said, screw it, I'll put it towards Persona. So, yep, 
good on me, I guess, to, to pick up a game I've wanted. Good on you. Yeah. Uh, as far as recently playing, I'll start this out. I actually know you played a game this week, so that's actually pretty cool, because last week you let me down. Um, Sukaden 2. I'm still playing it. Uh, I've put in another two hours. I completed a few areas. Um, I am currently going in to defend the city of, I think it's Greenfield. Um, picked up a lot more characters, and I'd say I'm probably about halfway through the game, I think. What do you think of the large battle mechanics? Because I'd only run into that like a couple times. So the large battle mechanics, they did it in Sukaden 1 as well as 2, and I'm not as big of a fan as the ones in 2 as I was with 1, although it's been a while, but I recall 1 just being a little more streamlined. This goes a little more in-depth, so... If you have um, magic or something, like you can use magic uh, with your, your army. Um, you're able to uh, change the formation of different armies and such. Like These are things that I don't recall being able to do in Sukunum 1. And, I mean, it's cool to an extent. Like It gives you a different viewpoint on a game and like, lets you actively engage. But I kind of almost wish that it was just an automated like scene. Like you just kind of saw these things happen and the different battles play out versus like having to actively engage and the little characters running across the screen, yelling like munchkins. And then you just see a couple of them get knocked out and then you just have to go through the, the tactical base of it. It's, it's okay, but it's definitely probably like my least favorite part of the game. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, so did you play, well, I know you played uh, ZOE. On a GBA? Yeah, I had some free time last week, and I was sitting there, and I was like, I got to get through this game. So I started playing it, and, you know, and I had a good few hours where I really kind of sat down and got into it, and the story started picking up. Like, I knew that some twists and turns were still coming in it, and I think I started to feel a little bit of that heart that I was a little nostalgic for in the game, and they stopped seeming so cardboard cutter you know cardboard cutout as characters and uh they really started to feel more like okay yeah these are believable characters and i like how they're the building it emotionally and you know oh i totally forgot about that so i'm actually i think the problem was that a lot of what i had played up till now is the parts that i remember from replaying through the game again in the past and now I'm starting to get into the stuff again that I've really only seen the one time. So in overall, it's pretty good so far? I think that it's ramping up to be better than what I said last week. Because last week, I think I talked about how I was like, eh, maybe it's not living up to the nostalgia. I'm still not sure if it's there yet, but it's definitely pushing it in a better direction than I felt previous. I feel better playing it now than I did a week ago. So how long, like, have you checked how long to beat on this game? I'm just curious. Like you said, you put in a few hours. Are you pretty close to the end of it? Um, I should be getting pretty close. I think that I'm on like mission 20 of 25 now, or it might be 30. I can't remember. I, cause I just, all I ever do is look at the other completed files that I have in there mm -hmm. and my levels jumped up a whole bunch. I forgot that the levels start getting more and more intense sort of it's a weird game because of the combat it's not really hard is my biggest problem with it now like after playing through that it doesn't feel like the the combat's getting more difficult it just feels like it's taking longer to do and it's because you have such a way to control whether you're receiving damage and whether you're dealing damage instead of just leaving it up to like a die roll in you know most other games and you can turn that setting on in this game but doing so makes it so you're less likely to actually hit and less likely to actually dodge when you could do it manually but when they're like okay the solution to making this more difficult is flooding the field with enemies now all of a sudden that seven second escape sequence for your defense in combat and your like six second attack that you have in combat now you're doing that all manually and you're locked into that amount of time instead of just letting it happen and when you're fighting 20 enemies instead of four enemies it really 
racks up how long you're spending in the level and it's not getting any harder it just feels like it's getting more tedious gotcha so hopefully uh it ends pretty soon for you man so you can jump into i guess uh zoe zoe one right or yeah that's yeah. the one i'm gonna do next and that one's only about seven hours so that's like a weekend type of thing if you sit yeah. back yeah i'll probably just knock that out between a recording session yeah that should be pretty good i hopefully man will I've just been so busy in the last few weeks with different life things that hopefully mm-hmm. I can finish that in the next uh, next week or so. I've been aiming to knock out, you know, three, four hours in a weekend, and I just get caught up. In, like, we went to Starfighters again. Yeah, shout out to Starfighters Arcade. That was awesome, finally getting out there and doing that. We had a great time playing some Madden. Or no, not Madden, Blitz. Blitz, NFL Blitz. Dude, that was cool being able to, like, just some random guy, and he's like, let's play team. Well, you know. Yeah, like, it was play three of us there, and we hooked up with a rando and just started playing, and it was great. We had a great time. We went into, like, triple overtime. Oh, dude, that was crazy, that triple overtime game. So, yeah, we had a good time with that. I can't believe that you used one of the worst teams in the game and, like, just kept up with us. Right. And that, it was crazy. And then we played, um, what what's the... Is it Hydro Thunder? I think. Yeah, I think it was Hydro Thunder. Yeah, we had all of us racing on Hydro Thunder for a while. Some pinball machines. Played some Gauntlet. Oh, dude, I love Gauntlet. Gauntlet was great. I totally forgot all about Gauntlet. Like, that's a game we need to play on N64. It's right there, and I got it inside the case right next to it. So yeah, dude, uh, Gauntlet would be awesome to play. Uh, we played some Mario, obviously. Um, you know, the old school with the POW and everything in the middle. I saw one thing that was interesting there. Well, you played Tempest. Yeah, I played Tempest, and, and that you was didn't really cool. It, but I got you on Instagram with that one. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a that was a fun game. Uh, I just watched Lazy Game Reviewer LGR. He put up a video. He bought a mini arcade cabinet of it. That it just looks so cool in the video. So as soon as I saw the machine there, I was like, oh, I got to see what this game's all about. Oh, dude, that other game what was Alien Extinction. Uh, no, it was Alien something. Regardless, it's... dude, it was pretty cool. Like. It, it might it have been like, Extinction. We got to go back and actually finish that one. Yeah, we, we only, only had finished, like one level left. Yeah, we had one level left, and by the time we went back, some kids were on it. But that was pretty awesome to be able to play some Alien. And I was that was probably one of the better um, gun con type games that I played in some time. Uh, just the overall mechanics of it were great. I mean, instead of having to like take your your handgun and move it up and then you know to reload and whatnot it was just like hey you got to shoot bullets as you see them on the screen which is pretty awesome because you could pretty consistently find bullets and uh, and napalm and everything else that you needed so the other thing that i played there that i thought was super weird it was a four player cabinet with two screens and it was at like an angle like two people on one side and two people on the other but on the side of it, it had a USS Enterprise, like, designed for the cabinet. And then on either screen, the one was Excite Bike and the other was Metroid. Or not Metroid, Castlevania. Castlevania. Yeah. And I was like, huh. That has to be a homemade cab. I, I haven't seen those before. I mean, the cabinet's there. probably real. I would wager that there's probably some kind of Star Trek game. That, that, uh, like, there's no way well, they never made a Star Trek well, yeah. arcade I mean, game. Well, I've been to um, Gallop and Ghost out in Chicago a few times, and which is awesome. Like, if you are in the Chicago area and uh, you've never been to that arcade, you have to go. Um, it's not in Chicago. It's in some suburbs right outside, probably about a 20-minute drive or so. That place is sweet. And they have tons of, I mean, well over 500 cabinets over there. And I had never seen that type of cabinet there either. And they got some rare stuff. So I'm. We'll have to do some yeah. research and see what we can find out on this because that would be something that I would be interested in. Maybe like talking to the guy who runs it and seeing how he set it up because I thought it was it was fun playing you know Metroid on the stick or mm-hmm. not Metroid. Uh, I keep wanting to say because of Metroidvania. Well, they did have Metroid there as well though. Oh, I didn't even see that one. Yeah, that was on um right next to X Men four player machine when you first mm-hmm. walk in. It's on the it's kind of huddled in the corner, but uh, yeah, they do have Metroid there as well. Yeah, so that's that's what took up most of my game time this week. Which was still awesome, because we got to play some games. So you did play games. It, yeah. yeah. Um, what was your thing? Oh, an update on Sukunen. So remember I was talking about the one character that I you could offer him to go into your oh, castle yeah, for free. Oh, yeah, with all the money. 10,000 pots or Did it come back? I finally got my 300,000 pots. She was like, I felt, I kind of actually felt bad for the, the game. It was just like... 
you know, he comes up and he's like this really happy go lucky, you know, seller. He's just like, Hey, uh, come over here. I want to show you something. He's like, look, I gathered everything. I'm so excited. I can finally sell. And it's like, I had the ability to just let you come in for free. And I was like, no, I'm going to screw this guy over, make him work his ass off and then take 300,000 pots from him. So, uh, I felt kind of bad after that, but it is what it is. It's hey, a, castles it's don't AI. build themselves. Yeah, ex- that is very true. They don't build themselves. And, uh, in fact, I saw some additions to the castle after that. So it's going to some good, uh, good items in there. Now, as far as um, our news this week, this is an interesting article that we pulled up. Yeah, uh, we've got a couple. This is a, a little bit different than some other things that we've talked about in the past, but it definitely is relevant, especially if you want to be a conscientious gamer or if you think about uh, you know the game industry in a certain way. This is another insight into... Some of the darker, weirder things that not everybody, you know, talks about all the time. Well, being in the U.S., I mean, we have so many different regulations from other countries. So um, this article is written by Stephen Messner of PC Gamer, and it's about China's anti-addiction regulations that they put on, well, really games in general. But it's talking about the moral dilemma that American game developers are put in uh, because of, you know, the regulations in China. And the key thing that they call out is that in China, they have it set up to where when you want to play an online game, you have to put in pretty much your national Chinese ID, which I guess would be equivalent for us of like maybe a social security number and uh, popping that in. And they're able, they regulate how much gaming time you actually have. And I think it was, was it kids under the age of 18 were limited to just two hours of gaming a day? Uh, That's what it came out to. I don't remember exactly what the article said on that. I'll look it up. But yeah, it was talking about the limited time that gamers can play but it also ties into the chinese social credit system that they have over there and that's that's a whole nother topic for people that you know know and understand more about it than we do i've got a little bit of passing familiarity but basically what the article gets at is that the social score for playing games could have a negative impact so if China can make it so that playing games reflects on you poorly as a person, and then how complicit are game companies going to be with basically telling the people that are playing their own games that they're bad for doing it? Well, and then tie in the fact that if a I, I don't know how China has this, but there's loot boxes, for example, over in China. So now you're feeding like, you know, they're already trying to combat, I guess, what they call a gaming addiction in China, but... Then you have loot boxes and such tied in potentially. Well, they have to have uh, complete, what is it, transparency. They have to show you the percentage chances of everything that you can get in those situations so that you can look at the numbers and decide, okay, is the odds worth the investment on that? But also with loot boxes, I mean, there's been a big push for you know, making loot boxes illegal in other places. And that's because we think, oh, well, these games shouldn't be preying on children. And not everybody agrees. They just passed a ruling in the UK, I think it was, saying that the whoever is putting the loot boxes in games while not actually being considered gambling under that regulatory body's point of view they still view it as a harmful practice and not something suitable for children at the very least so i know there's discussion going towards should these be marketed towards children at all now in this situation where we have game companies being complicit in something else dubious which is caving to the idea that well, a police the state, government much. yeah policing yeah. you and all of your activities and letting everybody else know that what they think. I mean, the article references people who have been denied uh, plane tickets based on their social credit. So imagine if playing games made it so that you couldn't get on an airplane and how participating in that really reflects on you as a company. Like, are you willing to just squeeze the money out of these people that want to play your games and then, you know, let them destroy their own lives because of the views of their government. Like, on some level, 
yes, you're a company. Yes, you want to make money, but you kind of can't just do that to the people that are playing your games because they love your games. You're really stabbing them in the back. And what's interesting, dude, is the article actually even starts out that's saying that it's the largest market for PC gamers in the world. Like that their PC gamer scene is China's crazy top tier huge. in the Dota scene. Yeah, which is nuts because if you're regulated for, you know, at least for ages 18 and under two hours, I, I guess I don't think it called out like if you're over 18 what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah, dude, that, that whiskey that we're drinking is sharp. I don't know what's in it. It's got to be because it's sitting in that crystal container. Um, so the overall market uh, is actually heavily censored and regulated in general. So it's just crazy that you have even like top tier teams coming out of China. Well, given Dota the 2 is a and... pretty benign game. And actually Dota 2, I mean, not for these players, but Dota 2 is totally free. But for like the top tier players who have all the like crazy, crazy expensive skins and stuff, I mean, you know, they rep those as much as anybody. But the the sheer amount of hours that they must log in that would totally destroy anything. But I'm sure that there's some kind there's of there's got to you know, be like a national, like a nationalist team of some sort where they're allowed to do it, and they're kind of uh, exception to the rule. I would imagine. I mean, I don't know for sure, but. That seems likely. I know that, you know, various countries have different level of government involvement with professional teams. I know that there's there's always issues with um, travel IDs, like certain competitors in certain competitions. When you go international like that, you can have issues with, oh, there's something wrong with your travel ID. And I would just hate for a scene that big with people that are that passionate about the games that there is a sense of it's not fair to them but on the other hand I don't I don't I've never heard of it that doesn't mean that it's never happened I've never heard of somebody dying playing games in like a PC LAN setup in America the way I've heard about it in Asia or people living out of like LAN hubs. I can't yeah, remember like, what you call them, but like PC lounges, you know, where you can go in yeah, and yeah. you can play any game. I've heard like they beat the crap out of people that are cheating and that type of stuff in some of those lounges across the world. Oh, see, I haven't heard that. But oh, yeah, yeah, that's just to tell you, it's like there is a certain level where it's like maybe some people do play games too much and maybe it's not a bad thing for, you know, I know games have had some mechanics in the past where it's like, oh, hey, why don't you... Your DS would tell you, hey, why don't you put this down and, like, go outside for a little bit or something? You know, certain things like that. Or I put I put my own parental sensor on my Switch to stop me from playing Cave Blazers so damn much. Yeah, I remember you saying that a while back. I don't know if we mentioned on the podcast, uh, but, yeah, I remember you saying that. That was actually a pretty funny story that you would censor yourself. And, dude, one other thing on here is how does this affect the developers in general? So, yeah, there's a moral component to it, but... If you're a developer and you have to like curve your, you know, your games to really fit that, you know, country, how does that work? I mean, I'm reading in here that they have rules against uh, like violence and gore and spiritualism and political messaging that isn't aligned to the Communist Party over there. Yeah. So does that mean that game developers are maybe withholding even publishing their games in China or are well, they having they'll to censor them and alter them? I mean, there's a lot of games I know that come out here in the US where they'll change sprites to make maybe a scanty scantily clad girl in a game a little less scantily clad because it's a little more heavily regulated here than it is over there. But then speaking, Australia will ban a game because it's too violent. Speaking of uh, games that aren't in the U.S., I had to, now that you've mentioned that. So I was watching uh, Game Grinder's recent pickups. So shout out to him. And most hilarious game I've ever seen. I didn't even know this thing exists. It's called The American Dream. And, yeah. So it's apparently a U.K.-based game. It's actually pretty cheap. It's on PS4. It's VR. But you wake up as an infant and you have handguns when you wake up as an infant and you go through the whole game living your life and completing all your tasks with guns like up until death you just have guns and the title being the american dream just i was dying in laughter from that man i have to pick up that game since you know we don't have to worry about um uh, region locks and all that on the ps4 that is certainly a game i need to pick up the play of job simulator so uh shout out to him that was a, a pretty hilarious uh pickup he had and 
I'm totally down to play that. Uh, but back to the article, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I really am the person to weigh in on this and, you know, tell anybody what to think. And I know from listening to the Jim Quisition and Jim Sterling that, you know, these companies, probably a lot of them high up where the decisions are actually made, don't really give a shit. And I also think that the games that this is really going to affect are mostly going to be the games that maybe should be under some tighter regulations. You know, like Dota. Well, no, no. Like I love Dota watching it, but those people, they put some serious time. I mean, the people who are professionals, you know, play it like it's their job and the best in they're the best in the world at doing their job. But there are lots of people who still play games like that that much regardless. And I'm not saying that that's a problem, but if it is a health concern for some people or, you know, other addictive behaviors like they're doing with the loot boxes, I see this as a negative for the freedom of the people who are there and have to pay for it with their social credit system that they're going to enact in 2020. But I think that, I don't know, it's a mixed bag. It's it's a bad look. It's a real bad look. But I don't think people who are out there generally making games that they love, that people are going to celebrate as great games, are going to be the games that these are affected by. And those are the games that I mostly care about. So I think that it's bad for the people, but probably not as bad for the studios that we really think about when we think of studios that we enjoy you and i personally well the other thing to really consider too man is that's a totally different culture you know on the other side of the world so we aren't part of that culture necessarily and we haven't grown up with strict regulations or a communist party or anything of that nature so for us to i guess kind of look at in a sense like it seems really bad for us because we have that freedom to be able to play hours upon hours of games and obviously that leads to things like addiction and, and loot boxes and everything else. And they're a little more strictly regulated or heavily regulated. But I mean, is it, you know, in their perspective in China and the people that live there, is this really a bad thing from their perspective? I mean, is this a good thing? Like, do they embrace that versus us where we would probably not embrace that in any capacity? Yeah, it's just something that culturally we don't know about. And, you know, we could look into this more and we could really see what it means for people in other places. And there's a lot more of this talk of international stuff going around. And, you know, the games industry is such a big thing now that it really, you can't think of it as, okay, this is an American game. This is a Japanese game. Cause there's not a whole lot of things that don't wind up crossing over because of markets. And I think that, it's just one of those things that you need to, if this is your thing, like we don't really talk about this stuff that often because it's a big topic and it's not really something I'm not really equipped or, you know, versed in these things, but it is good to look sometimes and see what's really going on and what's really affecting people when it comes to the industry and when it comes to people that do games differently than you do. Yeah, and uh, if you are listening to us from another country, we're watching you, UK guy or girl who downloads our episodes. Uh, feel thank free to you. Com yes, thank you. Uh, feel free to uh, comment in there about how your country of origin or the country you live in, um, you know how gaming is in those in those you know yeah, countries. Let us I'd definitely know what, be curious. Let us know how you game and what your country thinks about your games. Definitely. Uh, and if you know any good games from your country that you can recommend to us and send them. And then besides, you know, the differences between us and China, there are, there's differences between us and all countries. And there's a difference between us and Japan. And I'd like to tell a little story that I heard once about that in Japan. Yeah. No, I didn't hear this in Japan. I heard this in a, in a YouTube episode about a guy in Japan, or a YouTube episode, a an episode or a video that Super Bunny Hop put up about game bars in Japan, 
And I went to one of those game bars when I was in Japan. And one of the people in that video said that when he ran into his issue, he went to his friend and he was like, I think I'm going to see a lawyer. And he was like, oh, that's so American of you. And in this situation, it was so American of us. So the Joy-Con drift had become such a big issue. We talked about this a little bit last week. And now there was a class action lawsuit starting to be filed for, okay, this is a big problem. We keep hearing about this problem. People keep talking about this problem. Let's start a class action lawsuit, see how many people we can get to sign up. And you know, the interesting about that class action lawsuit, dude, um, this article you pulled up was July 22nd. We recorded, uh, it actually came out. The class action lawsuit came out the day after we recorded last week. Yep. I was so pissed. I'm like, we just covered this and news is already through. Hey, you know, we're, we know the pulse of the people, John, we know what the people want to hear. Oh, certainly. And uh, here you go. Lawsuit uh, follows a preliminary investigation opened by the firm on July 18th. We recorded on the 17th. And then killing me. Just once again, we were putting together the outline for this episode and we threw this article in. And wouldn't you know it right after that? But lucky for us, right before we actually recorded the next day, bam, the lights change. And Nintendo says, guess what, people? We'll fix your Joy-Cons for free, and if we charged you, we'll give you your money back. Jeez. So let's actually go into the lawsuit and kind of what it covered, and then we can jump into, you know, what Nintendo's actively going to do. Obviously, they're going to fix it for free and refund, folks. Um, so the uh, the associate attorney for, um, looks like Andrew Farrick, uh, told Polygon, that's the article uh, that we're reading, this one was written by Anna Diaz, basically said that, Within a 24-hour period, they had heard from 5,500 consumers over issues with the quality of the product. And uh, the lawsuit came as, you know, recent development of Joy-Con Drift and basically alleging that it was a hardware defect, which um, one of our users who used to live in Arizona, as a matter of fact, had mentioned that the issue is dust is what he's noticed. And that whenever he blows out dust from his controller, there's no problems anymore. Not sure if that's, you know, a permanent fix and how long that might last. But that's, uh, you know, apparently if you've got a can of air, blow into your controller and clean it out and should get rid of a drift for at least a little bit. See, I've been borrowing my friend's Joy-Cons for so long, I can finally hold on to them until I mail mine in and then give them back to him. Yeah, so uh, there's actually websites that have like DIY fixes for the issue. Uh, well, last week we talked about it was what the guy say in that article, like it could cost you three dollars to fix or something. Yeah, something like that. That something outrageous. It's like there's no way you can ship something yeah, like just cheap buy enough it. for three dollars to fix my problem. Well, I mean, you can. I've seen it. Seen some pretty cheap, uh, some pretty cheap items. What did the, there. apparently if dust yeah. is the problem and can't air, what they, you just blow into an envelope, buy a regular postage stamp. Mail it to yourself and open it in front of the controller. It'll fix the problem. There you go. There no, you, you go. just less well, than can't, three dollar fix. Canned air is good enough. No, uh, I think he was talking about getting the actual uh, joystick itself, and that's usually about a buck to a buck fifty. And shipping on something like that's less than a dollar. Damn. So you know, I, I can shows see that. what I know. Well, I mean, you got to get on eBay more often, sir. Although it'll take you two weeks to get it from China. So um. Yeah, I mean, that's just the base of the article. 5,500 people were pissed, and oh, here we go. Correction, a previous version of this article misstated the number of consumers that contacted the law firm. So it was actually 55,000 people. No, 55,000 was what they wrote initially, and oh. they corrected it to 5,500. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Not to be confusing. Yeah, not to be confusing. Thanks for adding the correction, Polygon. Maybe you should have just... You know, hey, they did what they did their due diligence. They did, but it, it didn't. It just said correction. It didn't say when it was corrected. See, okay, whatever. Um, and then since the uh, article, uh, Vice Games revealed an internal memo from Nintendo announcing the company will repair Joy-Con controllers at no charge. So let's jump into that article, which is through Kotaku and is written by Luke Plunkett. And uh, report: Nintendo will fix broken Joy Cons for free and refund prior repairs. So this is a really great move for Nintendo, especially I think that we've not heard this response 
either there's not enough people who are being vocal and then all of a sudden everybody really got vocal about it, or this is a direct response to the people who are like, well, you haven't fixed Joy-Con drift. I'm not going to buy a Switch Lite. And I really think that that's what this is. This is a PR move ahead of time before the Switch Lite comes out so that people realize, hey, uh, Nintendo's aware of the problem and hopefully they're at least going to try to fix it in the Switch Lite before it ships. You know, I don't know if that's actually going to happen or not. It's just speculation. But I've seen so much more about that that says, hey, you know, your console is doomed beforehand. That seems like it's going to get a response more than a bunch of people who are like, hey, my Switch Joy-Cons are broke. Well, you know, I I think it's fair of them, though, to refund people who have already paid. Well, I, I mean, I haven't had my Switch broken, so I, I don't know exactly what the cost might be. Uh, I imagine at some point I will experience the Joy-Con drift. I don't play my Switch as often as I could, and I also dust a lot, so I don't think that'll be an issue. Um, as far as this response from Nintendo, it honestly has to be due to the fact that they've gone ahead and uh, had this action class action lawsuit filed against them. And it's like, rather than deal with all that, let's just go ahead and say we're going to take care of the repair. We don't have to worry about anything involved in that. They may still deal with a class action lawsuit of some sort from people that say you've hurt my playtime and destroyed times with my family. I, I have no idea, but um, at least they're doing something about it now, which is cool. Yeah, and I think that it's important that we think about this as you know a good way to help fix the people who are having this problem but you know we should also think of this as like a way to tell people who are gonna buy a switch light that hey you might miss out on a couple weeks of game time because you actually have to send your whole thing in and maybe if they're saying that this is a problem and it's not fixed in the Switch Lite, maybe it's not worth it to buy the Switch Lite. Maybe it's worth it to buy the regular Switch, get yourself an extra set of Joy-Cons so that you don't have to worry about, well, shit, there goes my whole console. Exactly, man. And uh, at least it didn't cost me anything to get it fixed. That's true. Speaking of Save other things. Save that $50 on it. Speaking of other things that didn't cost anything to get fixed, do you want to jump into our... Uh... Inflation, deflation? Uh, yeah, so... Hold on, hold on, before you start, let me shoot the rest of this whiskey, because I'm going to be coughing for a moment. This stuff is ridiculous. Okay, so, go ahead. G give me a moment. That was pretty bad, dude. So, oh my God. What, who, what whiskey sponsor do we have this week? <laughs> it's not as bad, it's just... God, man. No, but who is it? What is it? I think it's um some Jim Beam that I got... In Christmas, and I also got like a crystal decanter with it, and I don't know what it is. That's man, too but... fancy for Jim Beam. Yeah, it, it definitely is, but at least that's it why it's it up. it's rejecting the crystal. Oh, that's exactly what it is, or the crystal's rejecting it and putting on kind all of like stuff. the symbiote was rejected by Spider Man and turned into Venom, and then they teamed up together to fight. Other bad symbiotes. guys on the street and other symbiotes in this week's inflation deflation we have venom and spider-man or is it spider-man and venom it's just separation anxiety it's with... just separation anxiety yeah, and i think it's separation i don't know man google it it's separation oh, anxiety this is a on terrible the look for us john it really is. Well, especially because i have it up already well, you're the one that prepares this statement for us it is venom spider-man separation anxiety i was right the first time although on the cover itself is just in big letters separation anxiety and a little itty bitty line that says venom and spider-man okay so you knew too yeah okay but so anyways big. this it's... week we did venom and spider-man separation anxiety something i'm definitely not gonna have when i leave john's house tonight so this was developed i, I just caught that shade that you threw at me this was developed by our previous friends, Software Creations and Acclaim, and they did uh, Arcade's Revenge and Maximum Carnage, which we've also looked at this month. Happy Spider Month. Uh, so this game originally came back out, apparently, came out uh, back in November of 95, a year after Maximum Carnage. And you know what? This one got dunked on the reviewers did not like it this got as low as a one star and as high as a 4.75 out of 10 
as far as I could tell. John, what did you actually think about the game? So it honestly, to me, felt like we were playing Maximum Carnage again, but just in a darker setting and with Spider-Man and Venom. You know, I thought it felt like that, but way better. Although I did not think the graphics were as good. I think that Maximum Carnage had more detail to it. It was a little... I mean, they're both cartoony, but it was a little less cartoony. Like, I felt like the the sprites were a little bit cleaner. Yeah, and that could be that we're putting it on a 4K TV versus the last one we played was on a, you know, little... I don't know what that is, 1080p, 720? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that could be the main reason on that, uh, given the sprites. But, in well, I mean, we played Arcade's Revenge, and it was pretty similar, right? In terms mm, of quality? Or was Arcade's no, Revenge Arcade's better? Revenge was a bit further behind. Okay, so I just remember the Spider-Man sprite. I think maybe it was just because it was a one-player game. The Spider-Man sprite was so much larger. Spider-Man sprite? The Spider-Man sprite was so much larger, I felt, because you only had to pay attention to you and not have two people independent. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, man. This game, while I did prefer to graphics Maximum Carnage, I kind of want to play Carnage on the SNES and see how that feels because... The controls were, for this were great. I mean, it was it was pretty the much the same game, good. dude. Yeah, it was very close to the same game. I mean, game. you had the shield with your, your web. You can grab people. You can grab two people at once. Uh, be able to sling up, crawl up on a wall. Like, everything was the same. Like, it literally felt like we were playing the same game. We just could play with two players. Yeah, and having two players was way more fun, especially because I got way further than John because I found two lives. Oh, yeah. I wonder who showed you where those two lives were. You I thought made it was... an educated guess. No, I didn't. I saw them. How do you think I was like, dude, swing up top and you'll grab, you know, health or whatever it was. And then it's like, oh, look, I'm dying. Like, dude, I was at two lives when that occurred. And you were at like one about to die. And it's like, oh, look, and John, then I, I outlived you. I outlived yeah. you by a long barely, time, Barely, dude, barely. No, I had, I made it a whole level without you practically. I went through two levels with you and died at the beginning of level three. Or was it the end of level two? No, I beat the end of level two. Okay, you beat the end of level two, but with what, like one life or two lives? No, because I made it way far through level three. All Anyways, right. whatever. So, Ryan. so we had a great time playing it. Uh, it handled really well. I really, I'm not a big beat 'em up, which is surprising because we played a bunch of beat 'em ups, and I think I'm starting to like them more. Like Streets of Rage, we got to play that. Yeah. Oh, we gotta we'll, play. Wait, you want to play Streets of Rage? Sure, dude. Sweet. We'll play that uh, in That's August. That's the one with the mayor that fights, right? Dude, I don't remember, dude. So, really quick before we move on. All right. So, I had asked some people on Cartridge Club, you know, if like what we should kind of play. There's been a few games that have come up. They had said um, co-op games and wrestling games. We don't necessarily have to play those, but it would be cool to play some more two-player games, even if it's not necessarily like co-op and not necessarily wrestling. Like, I'd be down to play... You know, shoot them up. That's uh, two players. Or, well, we had a great time with what was that? Oh, you got those light guns. Oh yeah, I got. Well, I got one. Oh, you only got well, one. And we have somebody stay in that room, so we can't play that one right now. Mm. Yeah, I'll get one more gun con. But yeah, I've got a, a gun con right up there for Time Crisis Three, so we can maybe uh, kick back. Uh, what was it? Uh, Vampire Night. Yeah. Maybe revisit that and uh, and play it with uh, gun cons this time. Yeah, that'd and be get pretty some, sweet. Get some other stuff we could check out. Uh, anyways, but to go back into it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I think that I don't know. Before we get into price, as far as what reviewers thought, do you think this was better than a one star game? Because I'm I'm I, struggling to see what made this a one star game. Somebody was smoking crack while they were trying to review it. Um, oh, and also full disclosure: after we lost, we put in some cheat codes, we got infinite lives, and we thought we were putting in level four. But it ended up being level 18. And it took us to the last level. That was and then hard, we beat dude. the game on infinite lives and we fought all the bosses at like once. I thought that we put on hard mode or something. I wasn't sure what was going on, but it very, you know, quickly became clear like, that's another. Oh, that's also another symbiote. Oh, that's another. Sy and we fought all the other symbiotes and then we fought Carnage at the end and we were like, oh, game over. I guess we finally beat a game on the inflation deflation challenge. No, no, no. no. We, we beat Mrs. Spider. Oh, we did beat Mrs. Spider, but yeah. just barely. Barely. Just, just barely. barely. That was a hard game. That was a tough one. Now, uh, as far as that final level is concerned, dude, that was difficult. Can you imagine yeah. playing that on one no. like one player no. and getting through all those levels and then finally getting let's maybe that's why it's one star and four point seven out of ten. 
That has maybe to be the, it. maybe it's just impossible to beat without codes. Maybe, but I mean that's why codes are there too. Like so you can do that and have fun. So I think that it's better than a one star for sure. But you know what? That's not really what we talk about here. When we talk about the inflation deflation challenge, we get down to the brass tax people and we tell them that, you know what? This game is crazy the way it's priced. So the most expensive version of this game is the PAL Super Nintendo version, which is currently sitting at 288.63 complete in box. That's down from $509.25 in March. Somebody got In boned. less than a year, this thing dropped, you know, $200. That's crazy. Yeah, somebody got boned on that, dude. So No, but multiple people looking at the history on price charting, you could see that with that game that it's actually had many sales at over the $500 level because that's the average over the life of the game bringing it now is there only one sale that hit at the 288 or is it like multiples are kind of like that stream down for no a no it's a it's a it's a idea of it based off of all the history of sales so it's down to 288 because it's been fluctuating so it's like people are paying like around 200 dollars or around $500, but there's not a lot of movement of it. So it's like sometimes people who just really want it, I guess they'll pay whatever. And then other people like you who are willing to wait will get it for a good deal. And then those get recorded against each other. Well, but I'll have people that's know. That's the most expensive version. I'll have people know the PAL regions that I am very happy right now. I live in the U.S. Well, and also anybody else online, you can get the North American Super Nintendo version for $22.44. That's the cheapest loose box price so you're gonna pay at least you know 20 ish bucks for this but you know if you want that complete inbox pal your super collector man bust out your wallet or wait for a good deal but the version we play the uh north american north american yep. super nintendo uh loose uh was the 2244 that's what you got there yeah, that's yeah. weird. I wrote down something else. I don't know why you wrote it there. No, no, that was sorry. That was the PAL SNES. I think that was that. Oh, the loose car. Loose was price? the loose one? Yeah. Well, or uh, it might have been a different version. Uh, I'll I'll double check yeah. on this. Ryan, you keep this talking is, about this the terrible. Box. I dropped the ball. Right. Yeah, he did drop the ball. All right, so complete in box in the U.S. We are looking at ninety dollars and fifteen cents with a peak back in twenty seventeen of May for one nineteen ninety nine. Ryan, why did you not just round up? You kill oh, me, the dude. NA Genesis is twenty two forty four. Okay, so North American Genesis version. I don't know, dude. We're giving people the numbers. I try to be straight with the numbers, you're, and then I screwed up. We the... might have to go through all the numbers again, Ryan. You're going to confuse people. All right, so pal, two eighty eight sixty three is what's currently running at complete in box. North American Genesis twenty two forty four, loose on the Super Nintendo. We're looking at twenty three ninety nine, a peak last October, so twenty eighteen of twenty five oh nine. And uh, right now it's trending up. It's been down a little bit, but it's going back up. So stonks are going up. Yeah. So if you're if you're looking to pick up a game, and you you can't wait, pick it up now and because it thing, looks like it's going up. One thing you did tell me before we started recording is that you checked to see if there's any trends of Spider-Man releases or anything like that. Yeah, I tried looking in to see if maybe this game has been fluctuating due to the market of you know Spider-Man coming out. I mean that's why we're playing it i mean you bought another copy of maximum carnage for this because spider-man was coming out we couldn't be the only ones but it really doesn't seem like the market trends in that way and i looked at this game in particular because there were some large historical spikes showing you know hey this is peaked and valleyed highly dude that at is, various times throughout the year that's some heavy volatility of yeah that game, in dude. 2014 it was over 100 and then dropped under 50. In 2016, it went from under 50 to over 100. And then last year, over 100, down to 50. And now it's peaking its way back up to 100. Like, this has a history of going up over $100. So if you want that complete in box while it's under 100 right now at 90, I'm not going to tell you that it's going to hold that value forever, but it definitely... You know, it's definitely going back up that direction. And I think that that's the thing that 
you know, we're trying to do with this. I don't know if we've ever really talked about it, but, you know, when we play these games, it's not just about what the game is, but it's also about if you're trying to buy into your collection or you really like these games, we want to let you know, is it actually worth the value? John, is this worth the $23.99 loose value that you have on it. What did I say Carnage was worth last week? Do you recall? Carnage? No, I mean, like, what did I personally say? Did I say... So I paid 30 bucks complete in box, and I felt that was worth it. Carnage was loose... Oh, no, you got it complete in box? was 2860 and that was down 8 bucks. Yeah. Over the last three months. Yeah, I think I picked it up for 30 complete in box on mine. So you overpaid? A little bit, yeah. But, I mean, it's a very clean copy. It looks good, like pristine well we had to get it for the show well yeah i mean of course it turned out i already had like a really screwed up black copy version of it um so let's see 23.99 loose god knows what i paid for this game you know i know what i paid for this game and i remember exactly when i bought it of course I bought you it do. For, yeah, i do because you're a true collector i am so i was at a flea market and then i randomly had a pickup from somebody on craigslist i hardly ever had pickups on craigslist out there and some girl had a bag of snes games that she was selling for 20 bucks and out of that bag i got a super mario world separation anxiety and a bunch of little five and six dollar games obviously sold the super mario to get most of my money back and maybe a few to five dollar games so i would say i probably paid five bucks for this back in the day i would probably currently play it or eh, buy it for Maybe fifteen is about. So what you I would... would pay maximum carnage price for separation anxiety. You said fifteen loose on there for what about the SNES version? Uh, I'd have to look that one up. I was just and looking keep in at mind I'm looking, dude. Keep in mind I'm looking at like a forty-five. Well, about a thirty-five to forty percent discount maximum on the loose carnage price. on Super Nintendo is twenty-three, so it's pretty much the same price as this. Yeah, so I wouldn't be paying maximum carnage rates. Um. I'd be so paying you think genre. that it's still over? You think this is still inflated? Yeah, I think it's inflated, dude. Like the game is cool; it plays like Maximum Carnage. Um, maybe that's just me being biased because I like Maximum Carnage and I just paid thirty dollars for complete in box. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum here, it's a cool beat 'em up. It's pretty difficult, and uh, you know, unless you're a huge Spider-Man fan, do yourself a favor and just get Maximum Carnage. The one cool thing, though, is that. This has two players, yes, yeah. and and the code entry. If, so if you're gonna if you're gonna buy either of these games that we've talked about, Maximum Carnage or Separation Anxiety, Maximum Carnage, I think it looks better for that price. I think it plays and I think slightly better. I couldn't tell. I sucked at it, but I think that you're gonna have a lot more fun with two players. I would pick this up over Maximum Carnage, but. I still don't think I would pay the twenty three ninety nine. I would say that loose. I wouldn't pay over twenty bucks for it. And I'm giving it the weight of being a multiplayer game because I think inherently picking up a multiplayer game is going. You're going to get more of your money's worth. I would say it's better than Arcade's Revenge for sure. Yeah, I don't think it's better than Carnage, but the multiplayer perspective of it does really increase the value for me a bit. Uh, one thing also to consider, and one of the things I brought up when we were playing, is the level seemed very drawn out. Like, oh, but were, it does have the best web swinging. It does have really good web swinging. But you know, when you're in a beat 'em up and you're just getting hammered by fifteen, you know, probably yeah, about fifteen people per section. That's a little crazy. And I mean, you're talking three, four sections. You're probably beating up forty-five individuals in well, a level. It's a beat 'em up, dude. Well, it's a beat 'em up, but that seemed pretty heavy, dude. Like I played a lot of beat 'em ups, and that seemed like quite a lot, especially in the first level. Like I can anticipate smaller enemies in like larger quantities later on, or like stronger enemies. This was like it also looked like some of the not the actual assets, but it looked like some of the ideas behind some of the sprites were reused. Like we were noticing the the girl the girls with the ponytails look very similar to the girls with the ponytails from the other game well, i mean it, it makes sense this is a year after carnage and they pretty much just rehashed the game it's kind of like um mario 2 where it's just i forget the name of the game but it's just a random game that was picked up and nintendo just straight up copied the whole game oh and Doki Doki mario, Doki panic yeah yeah it, it's like it feels the same thing as that like carnage was released a year later like hey uh carnage was great 
let's release the same game, make it a little different, not copy the other person's homework, and we'll make it two players. So they tried to improve on that, but I, I really wish they just would have done two players on Carnage. That's, that's a little different than actually what happened with Doki Doki Panic. I can't explain it off the top of my head, but you should look into it. Yeah, it's a straight ripoff. No, no, it's 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 different. It was a brand deal in Japan, and then they released it outside of Japan with the skin to actually sell the game. So basically, they just copied homework and released it outside of the Japan. No, no, it was like a, it was an yeah, effort. They, they they bought it, right? You'd have to, you uh, look I'll it look. up. You look it up. Everybody on the internet yell at John for not knowing this. You don't know it off the top of your head either. I know the story. I'm just saying that I don't know it well enough to explain all the details to you right here, right now, in front of, you know, that one person in the UK that's still listening to us. Hey, thanks. Thanks again. Yeah. And that one person in Kuwait. I have no idea how so we got to you we've in gone, Kuwait. We've gone on about this. John, you're saying inflated. I'm saying inflated. I'm saying that next week... We're going to move on up, and we're going to play the best Spider-Man game, the new Spider-Man game that everybody loves. We're going to check that out. The Atari 2600. No, I'm just kidding. We're playing a PS4 version. Yep. PS4 yeah. Spider-Man. And uh, So i got to crack it open. I haven't even opened the, back, the box yet, dude. So everybody stay tuned. We'll be back next week. We're not ending yet, though, Ryan. It, dude, don't give me that look. we got to tell people that we're on YouTube. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're, we're on, on Twitter. iTunes. Everybody iTunes. loves us on iHeartRadio. It's yeah. just all the heart they have. Exactly. Spotify, uh, UK, UK guy, uh, Canada, we got a listener. And uh, whoever's listening to us in New York, thank you very much. That's a lot of downloads, actually. Yeah. So uh, appreciate Tell that your very friends. Much. Tell your friends, like, New York guy, UK person. Yeah. And whoever's in Tennessee, I don't know how we're getting Tennessee downloads, but we are now. Tennessee, so tell your friends. We should just call out the whole U.S. Everybody's downloading our stuff. It's fantastic. So thanks, everybody, supporting us. And uh, catch us on social media. We've got some cool articles. we got some great memes. And, uh, of course, some awesome pictures as well. So do you want to end it there, Ryan? Let's end it there, John. All right. Well, I'm John. I'm Ryan. And we are the, the Game, Game Deflators. Deflators. Thank you, everyone.